right, everybody, we just finished ch- saying things up here. Welcome to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we're using the art and science of games. I'm, of course, Josh Placer, and we have another developer guest lined up today. I am talking with one of the developers of Machin and Mensch, the developers behind the Curious Expedition series. They just released the second one out early access earlier this year. And he's going to talk a little bit about the studio, the game, as well as some roguelike design. So, please welcome Riyad. How are you doing? Hello. Hey. Uh, yeah, excited to be here and talking about uh, roguelikes. Mm-hmm. For my audience here, they know that we have certainly spoken a lot about roguelike design. <laughs> but it is great to have you on. And I know we certainly have a lot to discuss. And for those of you watching this live or record, if you have any questions for React, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments or in the chat. So, I've had a chance to play both games. They're very interesting in terms of their design. What I found just like kind of funny is when I played the first one, it came out like right around the time I was playing a renowned Explorers, International Society by Abbey Games. Have you heard of them? And it was just yeah, such... Yeah, yeah. It was just like an interesting time to play like two games about ex- exploration like that. So, I guess to begin with, since it's your first time on the cast, could you talk a little bit about who you are in terms of game dev? And for people uh, watching or listening, what is Curious Expedition as a series? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I'm a game developer since 2007 by now, I think. I used to work in the AAA industry. I'm based in Berlin, Germany. And um, I used to work seven years at a Berlin company called Jaga, okay. uh, where I worked on games like Spec Ops The Line and okay. uh, Dead Island 2 and some other unannounced stuff. Mm-hmm. And then in 2014, uh, me and a colleague decided uh, to start our own company, Machine Mensch. And we released Curious Expedition and um, it was uh, successful for us. It was just created by the two of us mostly uh, so that enabled us to work on the sequel with, um, with the help of a publisher and yeah like you said that just came out recently mm-hmm. and if i would have to describe curious expedition i would it's kind of hard to describe um i would say it's it's a genre mix uh what we try to do is kind of capture that feeling of going into the unknown and having adventures there and also deal with uh, kind of the dangers of being isolated for a long time and um and all those things so we draw inspiration from a lot of genres but the one that's probably closest overall is is the roguelike genre because it's a it's a natural match for our for this fantasy that we are kind of chasing great and yeah like uh I'm a huge fan of Spec Ops Align. It's certainly one of the more interesting games to play. That would be something I would love to talk about at a later time, because I'm sure we could spend a lot of time discussing the intricacies of that one. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and uh, funny enough, it's uh, Spec Ops Align was inspired by Heart of Darkness, mm-hmm. uh, and then like Apocalypse Now, then, um, and uh, Curious Expedition is also partly inspired by Heart of Darkness, so there's, there's even a <laughs> game connection there. Nice. So, uh, besides Heart of Darkness, anything else inspired uh, you and the rest of the studio with the Curious Expedition in terms of, like, the design or, I guess, like, the general aesthetics of it? Yeah, I mean, of course, Indiana Jones, like, uh, pop culture and so on, there are some references in there, and it's, like, part of our childhood, uh, watching those movies. Also, Jules Verne um, is it's a big inspiration. And then I would say just historical um, expeditions, like real-world expeditions that happened and uh, the history ar- around those. Um, the game is set in the late 19th century, so it's um, it's kind of a bit after the initial exploration. Um, but, yeah, so we are kind of like in the late stages of like uh, exploring the world and... Uh, like discovering those uncharted areas for the Western world. Um, so yeah, I think those are our inspirations. And then, of course, um, with the historic setting, there comes like a, a certain responsibility of also tackling that responsibly. 
Uh, that's at least what we try to do because it's also a era that's associated with a lot of exploitation and racism in, in these subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I know uh, with both games, you allow, you have like each one of like your uh, expedition mates and your crewmates having various traits, both positive and negative. And I guess that, that could be a very interesting question, especially given your background working on Spec Ops that also dealt with kind of some controversial issues and some things. I think we just had a conversation about this on one of our other podcasts. We were talking about games that talk about like realism or realistic situations. And we, of course, brought up the infamous scene from Spec Ops. And mm -hmm. it is, I think, a very careful line developers have to walk. So I guess my next question for you is, uh, with the Curious Expedition series, again, as you said, in that period that's also known for, you know, exploitation and some very uh, disturbing things that have happened, how do you think your studio and the games kind of, like, towed the line between, you know, showing this stuff off without kind of exploiting it or glorifying it? Right, I... The very first question initially was, should we portray this, these areas or touch on those subjects at all, right? Because there are a lot of games that choose to like completely forego those uh, subjects and like um, set their historic games kind of in a, um, yeah, kind of like a whitewashed uh, fantasy version of it. And our game is also very fantastic. Uh, um, but we decided that we kind of want to talk about those subjects as well. Uh, we it comes kind of with the territory. We cannot just make a game where this, where it's it's like a completely clean version uh, of history. Um, so we try to to touch on those subjects, but it's not like the super central theme of the game. Uh, but it's in there, um, and I guess. Yeah, I, one inspiration I forgot is, is also H.P. Lovecraft, uh, his work. I mean, the main resource on in the game is, is uh, sanity. <laughs> uh, so it's a lot about mm. kind of losing control. You don't have full control over your own um, experience and your own sanity. There's like a, um, what's the word? Like the uh, an unreliable narrator mm -hmm. uh, telling the story. Um, yeah, and th th that goes also for your for your track members. They are, they don't like you said. They are not all uh, positive traits. They also have negative traits, and you're sometimes not sure if you can even trust them. <laughs> they mm -hmm. they might stage a mutiny at some point if you mm -hmm. uh, if you don't make good decisions in their in their eyes. Mm -hmm. I think one of them had the uh, kleptomania trait, which I have bad memories of that from playing Darkest Dungeon. What can happen if you have something like that in your team? <laughs> yeah, it can become very dangerous. Uh, there's also, uh, yeah, the the racist or sexist trait of of characters that they can have. Mm -hmm. So it can. Be, uh, this is a this is kind of like I, I guess a um, unusual choice uh, overall to have like to be able to have characters in your track and like having to rely on them that you actually don't like as a as humans. Kind of like that a lot, like. Yeah, that you wouldn't hang out with in real life, or that are not heroes. Like, uh, even you as the as the main leader are, are not necessarily a a um a hero. Uh, the way we see the game, it's kind of a bit like a satire of um of the subject, and the the characters are a bit naive and uh, underprepared. Kind of like you as a player when you start out and you don't know a game and mm -hmm. you start trying to understand the mechanics, but you're not quite sure what you're doing. And the, these characters are in the same uh, situation as you are. They have kind of might never had, have done an expedition, so they come uh, very uh, badly prepared. <laughs> and I guess. Uh, uh... Building off of that, one thing I wanted to ask you about, in terms of the roguelike design itself, like Curious Expedition is on the horror side, especially when you're trying to learn it. As you say, like with Sandy being one of your primary resources, it's very easy for things to go downhill, as we saw when I played the game a few times. In terms of difficulty, how did 
uh, you wanted to, I guess, make or balance the game? Like, in terms of how easy did you want to make a run versus how hard? Uh, yeah, the game is definitely on the harder side. There are multiple difficulty settings. Uh, but even so, there's a lot, there are a lot of mechanics that we need to explain. And just the, the amount of, of mechanics can make the game feel a bit um, overwhelming at the start. I mean, there was a big focus for us in the sequel to improve the tutorials, improve the readability, and so on. But at the end of the day, mm, yeah, we try to ease you in as much as possible, but it, it, in the, at the end of the day, it is supposed to be kind of like a complex game to a certain degree. And um, if you want to dig into that really deeply, uh, we, we have some players that have played like, that have left reviews uh, of like over 200 hours having played. And um, it's important for us to have mechanics that hold up that long. Um, so that, that comes naturally with a certain balance. I mean, overall balancing is always hard because I, I constantly see new strategies in the game, new exploits, new, new ways of um, using combinations of characters and items. So it's kind of like a, <laughs> a, yeah, constantly catching up uh, and seeing like new exploits and trying to think what to do about them how mm -hmm. to balance them without destroying the players fun because uh there's also a lot a big joy in like coming coming up with like a really cool strategy and uh making it work and we also don't want to destroy that so it's it's tricky uh it's tricky to balance a game game like this mm -hmm. and especially with the roguelike elements of it because it means that outside your starting tutorial you don't really have kind of the control or the framing to kind of walk the player through the onboarding of your game. Like, if they're having trouble with the game and they're already on Island 1, you know, they can have a very easy play or things that just go downhill and they may not know why they're failing. Yeah, and there are a lot of um, mechanics that are not super obvious at first. Mm -hmm. For example... Uh, so you go through these uh, randomly generated ter terrains um, and there are points of interest, locations that you can visit. And those locations are not immediately visible. They are first displayed as a question mark. And then once you get close to the question mark, you see kind of what type of location it is. Mm -hmm. And at first, like the first couple of playthroughs or sessions, you might think, oh, th this is probably pre pretty random. Uh, the way these are allocated. But if you play longer or if you read the strategy guide, you will realize that all these locations have certain um, patterns in which they are arranged. So um, so a location uh, is defined by the tiles, kind of it's surrounded. Then in the vicinity of those locations, there will be like small hints, like statues or, or like crosses or things like that. So if you a really a experienced player just looking at the map you see so much more than a beginning player because you see like oh okay there's like the, the small statue here that means there's probably like a shrine location five tides east to it and so on um mm -hmm. so that's that that's uh, hard to learn, but and then again, it's the question of like how much of that do we give away right away and so on. We try to make it more readable in the in the sequel, but I think people will be rather, I think the general thing is they, they will rather be surprised by how complex it is uh, versus the other way around. I don't think you look at the game and then you play it and you think, think like, oh, this is actually quite simple. I think it's more, it un reveals its full complexity once you get really deep into it. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges of Curious Expedition, something that I see also in Renowned Explorers and a lot of the more interesting or more modern takes on roguelike design is that concept of, you know, the um, positive feedback loop or the negative feedback loop, that mm -hmm. things can keep going good and good and good until something bad happens and then the downward spiral can take effect. Like with some of the ones that I've had, that things are going well 
then I can't get any sanity, then the sanity drops, then all the negative events happen, and then suddenly, you know, somebody ran off, somebody else got eaten, and then I'm, like, left all alone. And trying to kind of manage, like, cascading failures like that is a very interesting aspect of roguelike design. Because in a roguelike, it is meant to be replayed, so you can have those spikiness, that spiky aspect of everything's good, and then it all goes to hell. With with the design of the game, how did you, like, decide on, again, like, how hard that you wanted to hit the player when something bad happened? <clears throat> um, yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good question. I think that's... Um... I, we have some uh, mechanics in there that kind of like act as a counterbalance. Like if you are um, very low on sanity, you might get a event that helps you kind of uh, get a leg up again. But generally, the that's that is the structure of the game. It has kind of like this vicious cycle of like a downward spiral uh, of things going uh, worse and worse and um, those are also often the most memorable stories that players tell. Uh, um, I mean, those there's always a a challenge of, uh, especially with random games uh, or like procedural games, to n let the pro the procedural nature really shine mm -hmm. and not like uh, restrict it too much, because it, it would be kind of easy for us to. Uh, to always counterbalance it and like keep you keep you like in the, in the middle ground, but we also don't want to do that, right? We want to have these like strong emotional responses by players where they something bad happens, like a, a minor thing at the beginning. Maybe maybe one of their track members gets angry and they don't think much of it, uh, and then at a later event, this angry person deals some something from the track and then leaves and then at a later event they they are missing this item and <laughs> and uh, it's kind of these these uh weird chain reactions uh which i think uh are also like ca cause for like a lot of memorable stories that people tell each other so we are trying to counter that to a certain degree but at the end of the day that's also like the design of the game and mm -hmm. The kind of feeling we want to have, like these cascading cas catastrophes that that ruin your run, and then you just start over, or you go home with your ship and uh, choose another uh, track. Mm -hmm. And procedural generation again, that is a topic in of itself. It's something that I talk a lot about in my next book. And part of the challenge, as you said, is you know how much you like led off the leash in a matter of speaking. Do you just let the game go completely crazy and put everything anywhere? Or do you try to rein that in? And the problem, of course, is if you rein in too far, then it's kind of like, why bother? Because you're just getting similar maps. If you go too far, then you have that case where it becomes near impossible to try and make something that can't even be doable in a lot of cases. Yeah, that's right. It's it's very easy to make a random game mm -hmm. <laughs> and just have like oh, yes. randomness all over the place. It's very hard to make like a well tuned uh, procedural game. Uh, and there's definitely, like you say, the, this challenge of this challenge of the. I think I heard one term which I like, which is like soup of randomness, where um, every everything kind of feels similar so you have a, a room uh, like a dungeon crawler and and every room they are like exactly like uh between two and four goblins for example mm -hmm. and i mean it might be procedural there might be a room with four goblins and one with two but those differences are not memorable and it might be like a different enemy type but again like if you play like 10 rooms in a row you do, at the end it will they will all feel like one room so you want to have like these um, outliers as well. So you want to have like a couple of rooms with like three goblins and then one room with like 10 dragons in it. <laughs> and th that moment would then be super memorable and you will be like, uh, be telling your friends that story. And even though it might be frustrating, 
uh, which can be a problem in itself. But I prefer that frustration over like this feeling of uh, sameness mm -hmm. all, all the time. Yeah. And that, like, trying to get that level of variance in a world, like, is very important. I think that is one of the things that kind of separates the very best from the maybe not so very best roguelikes I've played. Because, like you said, if I get, like, 100 different runs and 90 of them or 95 of them are just the same exact thing, why bother keep playing it? So what we've seen is that some of the more interesting ones allow for that nature of spikiness so that one run can be incredibly well, you know, how could I ever lose, you know, it's so easy. And the next run you are just kind of, you know, grasping at straws, hoping for that resource to keep you going and everything in between. Yeah, I, I think if you ask uh, players, um, uh, most of them would probably uh, say they don't want that level of randomness. Um, but if they if they get that game that's super well balanced and like always the same experience, it would get very boring very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, is it's even even to the degree where <laughs> we fixed issues in the game and then uh, removed the fix again because we like the previous version more. Like, um, yeah, one stupid example, which is not super fitting to the balancing aspect, but we had this bug where um, animals would speak. So you have these random chat lines and then your donkey would comment on stuff and so on. And uh, we fixed that thing, but we realized like afterwards that that was that those were memorable moments like a lot of people <laughs> tweeted about like and made screenshots of like oh my donkey is commenting on my misery and so on <laughs> so uh we actually put that back into the game and we framed it as like i said since you have a, a unreliable narrator we kind of get away with it and uh, that's in a lot of cases where it feels like when we get a bug report or something it feels like the first intuitive thing is to be like okay let's Let's fix it by not letting the situation happen. Let's just restrict the game space a little bit further. And there's like a there, there's a certain danger to that where if you restrict the the randomness too much, yeah, then then nothing stands out anymore and yeah. uh, it's unexciting. I do have to say, my donkey is coming on my misery is a really good expression. That's a really good story <laughs> starter right there. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You see, that that, uh, that that kind of stuff is important, even those bugs. Mm -hmm. A question from chat from uh, Mr. Elrude. Uh, they asked, uh, they were curious about how much step up it was in terms of time and or cost for the uh, graphical change between the first and the second games. And for those of you watching, the first game was more of a pixel art style, while the second one has more of a like a comic book kind of aesthetic to it. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a big challenge for us. Um, when we decided to do the sequel, I think the very first discussion about it, the very first brainstorming, was more in the in the vein of like. Oh, this was this game was really hard to make. Uh, we didn't know the genre at the beginning. We didn't know the rule set or anything uh, because we we didn't look at other games for inspiration. Uh, so we iterated a huge amount of time and almost canceled it a couple of times during uh, the development. So for the sequel, we were like, okay, now we figured it out. Let's take it a bit easier this time and just do the sequel that everybody wants and have an easier time. And then we had to go ahead and like make life hard on us again by ramping up the production value so much. So all the new, uh, we changed engines, we changed the art style, we added animation, the, the whole event sequence are so much more staged now. So it was quite a challenge to, to make this game and uh, required a much bigger team. So the team grew from like two people to around nine people in-house. Um, and it still feels like, yeah, we had to stretch ourselves a lot to 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 get it even done. Uh, so it's, I'm I'm pretty happy with the outcome. Mm -hmm. How did you settle on the comic book style for the second game compared to the first one? On the combat style, you said? Uh, comic book, the actual aesthetic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, that's a, that's actually a, a funny story. Uh, which okay, um, initially we we are sharing. Um, we have this co-working space in Berlin that we f uh, co-founded, which is a mm -hmm. game uh, co-working space for indie game developers, and we were sharing this uh, uh, office with uh, Thomas Vandenberg, who did Kingdom, and he's he has also like a very a beautiful uh, pixel art game. And we, we looked at our game and, and we talked with him and so on. And we we concepted some screenshots for, for the sequel and looked also at existing mods for the first game because they are like some <laughs> amazing uh, pixel art mods uh, that redo uh, uh, the graphics of the game. And we didn't come up with a good idea of how to make the sequel stand out so much that it wouldn't feel lazy kind of where where it's just like a little bit better uh pixel art or like higher res pixel art but we we felt like if we would show this game or if you would see a screenshot you might mistake it for the first game um and we didn't want that we wanted it to be like very obviously it's its own thing and so for the first game linear claire or this uh, tintin art style was actually the was already a inspiration uh but it was kind of like a pixel art version of that. But if you if you look at the pixel art of first game, if you look at the eyes and so on, it is already kind of inspired uh, by that art style. So we went kind of closer to the source material. Mm -hmm. And um, the funny thing uh, about the final decision was that a, a couple of fans from Germany created a board game version of Curious Expedition. And uh, we invited them to the office to just uh, uh, play the game with them and have a good time. And as a gift, they gave us this, uh, they brought along this card game called mm -hmm. Lost Expedition, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and we looked at the card game and we were thinking about it. And the card game was like, uh, for weeks we were thinking about the art style. And the card game was there just the whole time laying on the table. And at one point, uh, my colleague, uh, the art director, Joh uh, Johannes Christmann said, hmm, this art style of this card game is really cool. Like this artist is amazing. I wonder." if we should just use this art style, uh, let me just reach out to the person that created that card game or that drew that card game. And so we did, and uh, he ended up doing all the art assets for, for Curious nice. Expedition 2. So it's, it's through this coincidence of these uh, fans doing a board game version, bringing this other game as a gift, us seeing that game, asking the artists of that game, and so on. And that's how it worked out in the end. Nice. And with, like, you were mentioned, of course, like playing the game tabletop or having a tabletop version of the Curious Expedition, I guess that's a good segue to talking more about the combat of the game because the combat is very much like tabletop focused or tabletop inspired with the dice based system. Where did the inspiration for that system originally come from with the first game? And then we'll talk more about what changed in the second one in a few minutes. Yeah, the, the combat went through a lot of um, iterations. Uh, during development of the first game, at some point, <laughs> we developed a one-dimensional dungeon crawler, we called it, where everybody, like... Be lined uh, your four characters and the enemy four characters would be lined up in the line and like their attacks would be based on like the their position in in the in the queue and so on which funny enough ended up to be like a core game design of another uh very famous game now um by but by that time it felt uh, pretty original but while we were working on it and like um playing around with ideas we realized that this combat mechanic was taking up more and more of our focus for the game. And it was steering us away from this initial idea of making a game about traveling and exploration. So we decided to completely um, throw that uh, away and launch the game without any combat mechanic at all during the, like the very first release. Mm -hmm. And then we reapproached it with a dice game because we thought that would be more fitting to kind of the space we want the combat to occupy in this game um we wanted to have a, especially a game mechanic which we wouldn't just use for combat but also for other encounters uh to decide things mm -hmm. and um why it ended up being exactly dice I, i'm not sure but i'm 
I'm very inspired by um, board games. I'm not a big board game player today, but when I grew up, I, I played a lot of board games. And my favorite book for, for a couple of years was this collection of board game manuals just printed in a book uh, and that I would just read over and over again and imagine like how it would be to play this game. And I was, I'm, I've been always fascinating with these um, board game design, which I think, I think what's special about board games is that the best board game is the one where you, it's not about adding more rules, but the best board game is when you cannot remove any rule anymore yeah. and everything is kind of like in sync with each other and uh, leaning on each other and so on. I think, yeah, that, that's, mm -hmm. that was a big inspiration for me always and somehow then ended up in the shape of dice in the game. Mm -hmm. And I think another aspect behind like tabletop design is that there is a simplicity to it that kind of helps the onboarding. The fact that you're not dealing with, you know, massive numbers. Like, I've spoken to a few tabletop developers in the past, and one of the big things they always say is that you have to keep this as something that people can just, you know, sit down and play. Like, you don't want people to have to pull out a calculator to try and figure out, okay, this guy has 687 points of damage, I have 422 points of defense, how we figure out what happened? It's, no, you have six, I have four, and six is greater than four, I win this fight kind of thing. Yeah, it's very immediate and something that everybody can relate to because everybody probably has played or has had dice in their hand at some point in their life. And for us, I, f I feel it's also funny that, I mean, the dice mechanic, um, like narratively is not explained in the game, but I imagine this dice game also being something kind of in, in the world that the that the characters in the world could also have these dice with them, right? And like maybe at at nighttime on the why they're resting like have a, a game of dice and so on i think that it's, it's a interesting idea mm -hmm. i'm curious i know with both games there is the kind of like the combo system that you can have the various dice interact with each other to do special moves along with it where did the design for that come from uh, I think for the first game, it was partly uh, inspired. I think the, the American name is Yats Yatsi, ah. right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, where you just roll and then try to get a better combo and re roll uh, partial dice uh, of those. I, I think that was a, a big inspiration for us. Um, and then, yeah, I think that that system was cool. A, a lot of people liked it. But for us, there was always something um, where we felt like oh, we could improve on this. And so we we changed it pretty drastically for the sequel. Um, the first game, uh, the, the dice system relied a lot on memorization and kind of discovering the, these the best combos. Um, we, we experimented during development with like showing a table on the screen that would directly say like okay use these three and this dice to get this effect and so on but it ended up so overwhelming and so kind of like mechanical and mm -hmm. un, yeah, unexciting that we kind of left it uh, a bit vague and a bit mysterious by design but for the sequel we we thought okay let's let's reapproach it and really try to make it so that this time it's really very readable and you really know before rolling the dice kind of what kind of effect, of effect you're going for uh, with the hopes of making the dice game more approachable but also deeper at the same time and that's yeah. something that's uh, act especially initially i think um people have kind of like understood now what we're doing but especially initially we got some um disappointed uh, players uh, reaction of like oh they dumped down the dice game mm -hmm. uh, whereas for us it was kind of the the goal was the opposite and I think the effect is also the opposite but it's just interesting like how these different impressions can can form mm -hmm. yeah, and it's always a challenge when you change systems and tweak them from game to game yeah uh, it is I mean it's uh, catch 22 because um, if you don't change things up 
people might say, uh, okay, it's just the same. I mean, I, I, it's, it's boring. Um, there's no, they didn't innovate on that. And if you do change it up, there's always the risk that you change it in a way that people don't like it. So it's, um, it's really hard to rely just on feedback in that area. It's just something where at the end of the day, we have to be happy with it and feel like we are making the best choice. Mm -hmm. And in terms of going from the first game to the second game, I think mean, that's a good another interesting topic. With the sequel, like after the release of the first game, what aspects, like, because we always talk about here on the channel about the importance of play testing and user feedback. Like, how did the reception of the first game kind of like inspired or direct you and the team with the sequel? Uh, yeah, of course. I, I mean, we 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 uh, care for feedback a lot. Uh, we have like on our Discord, we have this decky board which like um, captures feedback and and funnels it directly into our project management system and so on. And we read the Steam forms. So all the the feedback is very important for us. I think big topics that we identified as things we wanted to improve are. We felt we have a really deep game, and we have found like a, like almost a new genre kind of. Um, and, but we did like do the best job in the world of explaining that genre. So that that was like a big focus for the sequel of like making it more approachable, uh, explaining more things. Um, so if you hover with your um, input device over over items in the game and so on. There's much more information now <laughs> than before, uh, much more information revealed. Um, and th that goes also in the, into the second point of people uh, criticize the degree of RNG. Um, I mean, I, that's uh, you will always get that with any roguelike. I think people um, commenting on like how, how random is it really? Uh, but that was also a big focus. And not in the sense of like removing randomness, but giving context to the randomness and explaining it better. I think that's, that's a, a very important uh, approach for us, like not making away with those exciting moments or this, this, these more emotional moments of like tension and like, oh, I hope this goes right. But if it goes wrong, explaining you better, like why you failed and giving you a better mm -hmm. ability to anticipate outcomes. Um, I think those... Those are pretty big areas, and then, uh, yeah, we spend a lot of time working on the on the campaign. So that's a completely new uh, aspect of the game, uh, like having a proper storyline in there, and also permanent or persistent uh, mm -hmm. upgrades. So there's like a a layer where you have these three explorer clubs, and the the things that you un unlock in them are persistent. So even if you fail a run, um, you don't start completely from zero. But I think then also a huge aspect was when we did the first game, uh, it was very inspired by Spelunky. Uh, mm. Kind of like the, I feel one of the most uh, influential games uh, of, of recent years because it really put the idea of like or this genre of rogue lights uh, into our heads and like this was even we started on the game before FTL and those other uh, big games uh, even expanded the genre further and so on the first game uh, just doing a rogue light was already pretty exciting but then for the sequel there's so many rogue lights now that we thought we felt like uh, we wanted to um, play around with the formula and like uh, provide different ways to play it. So you have, so the second game is more has like a campaign structure. It has you can choose if you want to play with permadeath or if you just want to restart like two expeditions and so on. So we are we moved a bit away from those super rigid roguelike structure. Um, but yeah, I. We have some interesting stuff there in the works also for a uh, update that's coming out fairly soon. I think that will that people that don't like this aspect that we kind of read back on the uh, roguelike aspect a bit that they will like a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 
trying to make that more appealing to a wider audience is certainly a challenge in of itself. As you said, with the sequel, there's now the persistent aspects of it, different difficulty settings, and these kinds of things I think are very fascinating. We're trying to design a roguelike experience because roguelike fans typically are on the more expert side. They like that level of challenge. But if you were trying to grow the market, grow the fan base, it feels like you do need to kind of ease more people into it. Like it reminds me a lot of the success Hades had that came out hmm. last year that Hades offers like a wealth of onboarding and new player tips and uh, modes to make it easier to play. But it does have, you know, on the other end of the scale, it can get very nasty if you turn like on all the difficulty modifiers and try and play like that. Yeah, it's tricky. It's especially uh, tricky for us because I feel the it's the game is a genre mix and it's kind of like a hybrid of like taking big chunks from rogue lights, but also taking big chunks of like just this narrative aspect and like the the relation between characters and so on i think it's something and also the narrative pieces like in, in all these story events is something that is, is pretty uncommon for for roguelikes um so we have like we have different player demographics kind of people playing that, that are really into like hardcore strategizing uh but we also have play uh, people that play just for the, the narrative uh, aspects and just for like these characters getting into fights or falling into love and so on. And that's, um, yeah, always hard for us to judge like which, for which of these groups uh, to create the game exactly. But um, uh, yeah, it's also, it's also nice to, to have this, this hybrid uh, because it's, it just represents also ourselves. Like uh, we like both things. We like narrative games, and we also like procedural games and like uh, mechanical games. And um, that's not always easy to communicate then in marketing. That mm -hmm. this is the fact. But so I, I've seen um, Hades, I think, coining the term narrative roguelike, and I think that's that's an interesting approach of of mm -hmm. communicating it. Mm -hmm, definitely. And with Curious Expedition, the sequel as well, you have that, as you said, that layer of storytelling going from island to island, to island and just trying to figure out what is happening. Now, uh, one thing that I noticed I wanted to uh, ask you about, in the first game, the story is kind of framed as a competition that you're trying to compete with the other explorers and you know how far you push it kind of determines whether or not you win or lose and of course you push it too far you end up in a bad situation you just lose it all with the sequel there's more of that mystery aspect that you're trying to get back to that island in the beginning there's less of that kind of competition at least from what i saw when i initially played it what was the decision to kind of like reframe the story or reframe the situation for the sequel yeah, and the, um, to talk about the first game, uh, first, the reason of those rivals being there is because it's a, it's partly a hunger clock for the game, uh, of course. So it's something that kind of drives you off the island and you cannot go on exploring forever. Sometimes that's uh, a criticism by players that they say, oh, but I want to explore forever. But I feel if you could do that and just roam freely, this is kind of not the game for that. This is uh, this this would reveal like all the mystery and like remove all that sense of wonder. Like, oh, I wonder what's behind that mountain and so on. For us, like having to make these hard choices and like not being able to see everything in every session is kind of part of the appeal. Mm -hmm. And that's why we had those rivals as kind of a hunger clock and like a a tropey mechanic to have in the game. Um, and uh, something that's like Indiana Jones has and so on, because yeah, the reason why you always have like those rivals is because you have to have some uh, some counter momentum, some some balancing thing which explains why <laughs> there's <laughs> all of a sudden th this urgency in discovering these shrines which have been laying there for like a thousand years. Like why 
why wouldn't like Indiana Jones when he tries to uh, <laughs> steal something from a tomb and, and fails, why wouldn't he just come back a week later with like a hundred other <laughs> helpers and so on? Uh, the reason for that is because there's always a rival right behind the corner that will arrive like one minute later and like take the the loot for themselves and so on, right? So um, so for us, it's similar. So it's just a mechanical way. Um, and for the sequel, yeah, we wanted to do a, a bit more world building. So there's like, the first game is in some areas very vague. Uh, and for the sequel, we wanted to explain a bit better, like where are you actually exactly going? Like where, why are these areas uncharted? What's the relation to the rest of the world? What impact on society does it have in this in our version of the world? Mm -hmm. And also the rivals not being just a number on the screen, but being like uh, forces that actually so you have they appear inside of the game and as part of story events and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, but but we still needed the hunger clock. We still needed a way to kind of end a exploration of the island. Um, so that's. We were looking for something that goes beyond just being a number on the screen, like in the first game. Uh, so we went with this idea of this uh, mysterious dimensional fog, which comes in and covers the island. And that acts like as a driving force to to end your session, kind of. Um, so we found we, we found a better way to represent both. Like we found a better way to represent like kind of like the trope of like these rivals actually appearing in the game. And we found also a hunger clock, which is like, more fitting to the world building and that's actually visually there in the game and it's not just a number on the screen but you literally see like the the fog coming back and like slowly encroaching on the island mm -hmm. yeah and that's a very interesting point about how different roguelike and roguelike games handle that whether you let the player just explore until they get tired or you kind of put like that you know the doomsday counter on the screen that if you don't leave by this point it all goes to hell you're going to fail and it kind of gets at like at the heart of as we said earlier about you know the downward spiral effect that if you let the player just have free reign to do as much as they want these games are typically about okay i'm going to get all the resources in area a then i go to area b get all the resources of b go to c and eventually, I'll just have this pool of resources that I can't, that it becomes very, very hard to lose. But when you have that clock, in fact, it makes it more likely that a downward spiral can happen. Because if you're not doing good on Island A, it's going to throw happens on Island B to Island C. And I guess for you and when you're designing Curious Expedition... How did you balance those two things? Like this gets kind of back to our discussion about difficulty earlier in the cast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, a as an important differentiator is that the winning strategy has to be fun. Uh, I like to play a game as good as possible. Mm -hmm. um, if I find out a way that's tedious, but better strategy-wise, I have to play that tedious way. And because the game is not fun anymore at that point, I will probably just not start it up again. So that was kind of like a big challenge. For, for me, one example of like uh, how other games deal with this is, for example, in I think the newer XCOMs handled that by adding a hunger clock, but the older ones, like, I mean, the, the first remake of it, I think there was n in a couple of uh, missions, at least there was no hunger clock at all. So the best strategy for playing that game would be, mm -hmm. even though you could walk up to like 10 tiles <laughs> or something in the round, would be to just walk like one tile or two tiles, right? Yep. And if you <laughs> deviated from that optimal strategy, you were having more fun, but you also made the game harder on yourself without any reward for making it harder for yourself. So, that, that, so it made me feel uh, like I had to play this game of like moving like one every person like one uh, space up one space up one space up which takes forever and is not fun and so on and for us that's kind of um it's important to make that winning strategy like the optimal strategy fun and it is not for me fun to like when you're in the level to search in every nook uh, and corner for like the the last coin that you can find that's not fun to like once you've beaten the game to go back and like look un in into every corner. Mm -hmm. Like for some people, that's fun, but not for me. I appreciate 
if the game tells me like no you cannot do that you cannot walk back and like <laughs> walk okay. over the whole empty level again and like look into every corner because that would be the optimal strategy like if there's no time limit but kind of we counter that and another example for example exactly this one space movement problem is we also had that in the beginning so at, when we prototype the game the optimal strategy would be uh, to just move one tile always and like because this would give you like a new visibility um, of the terrain and then you could make one step again and uh, kind of you would have the the most informed decisions if you move like super carefully like slowly but mm -hmm. so for like the, the regular game we give you a base cost for movement mm -hmm. which makes it uh, so that actually moving a lot of as far as possible in every turn to get the most out of your initial base cost that you're paying up is the best strategy, which which also happens to be the most uh, the most fun strategy, I think, because it's it gives you like this the sense of like oh I, I'm not exactly sure where I'm heading and so on. So yeah, I think that that's a a big design goal for us to align those the the optimal and the most fun way of playing. Mm -hmm. As you were describing XCOM, I just got very painful flashbacks of playing uh, both XCOM and XCOM 2 by Fraxis. because it, Or just the original one. Because as you said, for a lot of these games, especially for roguelike style games that are just heavily systems-based, there is oftentimes that optimal strategy. You know, it's the most boring, the most time-consuming strategy, but it works. And oftentimes yeah. it works so well that A, it can just kill any sense of procedural generation or variance, and B, once you start doing it, it becomes hard not to do it. And yeah. I'm the same way as you that if I figure out that there is the you know the ultimate game breaking cheese strategy, that once I figure that out, I have to resist not to do it. Because if I start doing it, I'm just going to do it every damn time. And then why even play this game anymore? Because, you know, I figure, you know, I peek behind the curtain. I've seen all the wires and now I know exactly how it all works. Yeah, it feels, uh, it feels kind of cheap then not to do it. It feels like the designer missed, like, didn't like the, the full job um, and kind of missed the gap there and then... Yeah, it's very uh, detracting uh, for some reason. And also, uh, in a lot of games, like especially like these these hardcore roguelikes, uh, those games are extremely punishing. Um, so if you make the slightest mistakes, they're very punishing. And I mean, Curious Expression can also be like that. But yeah, we try to allow you to to counter that by allow to allow you to do weird uh, things uh, sometimes and not punish you all the time it reminds me of when i used to play uh, i used to play a lot of pen and paper and like dark um uh, not dark dungeon but uh, dungeons and dragons and so on and i would play with this dungeon master who always when we went into like a room and there was something cool there uh like a like a torch angled at the wall in the mist in the weird way where you think like oh it's probably a trap door like a, a treasure and whenever we we would try anything it was it would always cause like oh you touch the torch and it's like a trap and like <laughs> you get hit by a fireball and then in the next room is like there's a treasure chest and then okay i try to open oh you get hit by like a, a <laughs> trap like by poison darts and so on and i'm like well what you're doing is training me to not do anything in this world yeah. like to not engage with anything and uh that that that's not fun like that's I can have that in real life where I'm like <laughs> safe and secure and so yeah. on. But if I go into these uh, fantastical worlds, I want to have fun and I want to be a, a reckless to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that happens to me so many times. And uh, I had a conversation with someone on Twitter about this, about trying to trust developers and part or trust developer in terms of the gameplay. And part of the problem that comes to roguelikes is when you have events that have such wildly different outcomes is a case of do i take this and you know maybe 40 percent of the time get something just okay or six percent of the time catastrophic failure that just end the run just you know reload and that happened to me a lot when i played ftl that it's like okay i could do this event up 
failed, now I lost a I lost my best crewmate. Or yeah. ship explodes, take all this damage. And like we said earlier, you have to be very mindful of how spiky you want these events to be. Because if it's a case of, you know, a little bit of good or absolutely bad that can happen, why would you take that risk? Because part of the challenge of playing roguelikes and roguelike design games is trying to mitigate that risks. Uh, like you said earlier, with the um, kind of reading the map example, that extra players know, okay, if I see this assortment of objects over here, okay, I can expect that kind of event. So I don't need to be as, you know, blindly just click over there and then run and, you know, hope something happens. I can kind of prepare and train myself for it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the being able to anticipate those things mm -hmm. uh, changes a lot. I mean, if I know I, I, I have this, I, I can pull on the slot machine and there's like a 90% chance it's positive, but 10% chance I die. Uh, I, I feel kind of that's fair. Uh, I mean, not in the real world, but inside of a game, I, I can make that call. And like, if I still fail, I, I might be upset naturally at that moment, but I, I'm not frustrated with the design of the game, more with myself, kind of like all the universe. Uh, um, but it's completely different if there's a slot machine without any information. I pull it and I just die. Hmm. And I don't even know like what, what, what was the chance for that. Like, um, and what it also does, it makes you never pull, use that slot machine again because you use it once, you died. Uh, it was such a frustrating experience. You you don't ha you don't gain any information about the probability, so it makes you not use that feature anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's also yeah. I mean, some of these lessons we we also didn't know when we started, right? It's I, I'm not talking from a a point of like oh this is like super obvious. Uh, this is just things we also learned ourselves where when you have a negative outcomes for events it's it's important to explain why they happen um mm -hmm. and give context to them because otherwise again like like in my previous example with like the the the, the, the poison darts and so on uh if you have one encounter and you hit the negative outcome right away it just teaches you to not engage with that out uh, that content mm -hmm. and you miss out on all the fun it could potentially deliver yeah and again, it gets back to what we were just saying about the optimal way to play. That if you're trying to play these games as perfectly as possible, you don't want to introduce randomness to your strategy because that can backfire on you. But as we just said, you need the player to kind of understand that, yes, yeah, something good could happen from this just as something bad. And I think that's one of the things that I've seen from a lot of like more of the modern roguelites or roguelites, how we want to describe the kind of games these days, is that it will tell you, you know, 60% chance to gain health, 40% chance to get punched in the face or anything like that. And I think that's important because you want the player to start to be able to understand, I think, the inner workings that, yes, if I'm, you know, if I desperately need health, and this event could maybe give it to me, okay, I can roll the dice. But if I have full health over and this event could possibly, you know, take one of my crew members or take a piece of equipment, I don't want to do that because why risk something when I don't need to? Yeah, it's. A, I think it's uh, always important to remember that, at least for us, we're not trying to simulate the real world. We're trying to mm -hmm. simulate a game model of the world that's more fun than the actual world um and uh, I, i'm not sure where i was going with that but i had a really good thought um <laughs> yeah no i lost it <laughs> that's but, all right what were you saying i think it might come back about uh giving the player the information about what can happen from an event whether you know you get you know gold oh, yeah. but lose health or get health and lose gold kind of thing right yeah i think the 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 game designer and the player they are collaborating with each other right and it's not our goal to kind of trick the players we let them in on the on the rules of the world even for example we could make the the terrain generation of the world much more random and much 
more realistic probably also. But we apply these procedural rules to kind of uh, get control over this generation. And then we try to communicate those rules to the players even. Like there's a certain pattern around how many villages are in each territory, how many shrine locations, how many loot locations, and so on. Mm -hmm. And th th those are not like mistakes, or it's not like that the player looks at them and understands th those patterns. I hope they don't get come away with the feeling of like, oh, okay, I see what you're doing there. This is like <laughs> so obvious that I, they should have made it more random. It is like unrandom by design to the degree that allows you to anticipate things and understand, oh, I found in one level, they are always like between one or two villages. Uh, I found already the two villages. So this this other one cannot be in another village. It has to be like a loot location or something. Mm -hmm. And also when you go to like certain locations, the effect they have are usually very similar. Uh, we don't want you to go to a location and spend the resources to get there and then hit you with a outcome that's kind of like uh not something you would expect because then it's it's not you cannot own the kind of like the the skill of the game kind of you cannot improve on your on your skill level if the outcomes are too random so there's yep. there are a lot of patterns a lot of rules that we are applying and even trying to tell the player uh without being too obvious you cannot be it, it's a game right we cannot be uh, like hey by the way like in this dungeon crawler there are always like two uh treasure chests per level and so on and like show you like the the building blocks on the screen or at least we we don't want to do that we want to be um uh a bit like uh f more natural and organic in the way we implement it but at the end of the day we want you to actually uh understand those rules and if you get like really deep into the game and you replay it a lot i think uh once you start understand like Uh, getting a intuition about those roots the, the game just gets even better and better because like stuff that might seem random at first you really start seeing like the 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 rule set behind it and it helps you get mm -hmm. better and like further into the uh, like get more fame and like uh, higher scores than without it yeah and i think that's a really great point about trying to make some of the better roguelike designs because it's something that we've seen a lot in games where the player if the outcomes are too random like you said it becomes impossible to try and learn the game or make a decision because it's a case of you know i click on something and one time it ends my game next time it gives me 10 million dollars how do i prepare for that how like where's the decision making it's just It, you're just essentially, you know, throwing dice and hoping that it lands, you know, all sixes. And by giving, like, having that kind of framework in place, as you said, it allows the player to start to put things together. Like, if I know, like, if let's say a mountain event could possibly give me a gun in, in another roguelike, I know that if I'm playing these games and I see a mountain over there, I see an event, Okay, if I need a new gun, there's a good chance I should go over here. Uh, for people watching, a really good example of this is from Monster Train. That Monster Train frames everything in terms of you make these different choices and you see what are the possible events on each line. You don't know what the outcomes perfectly, but I know that, okay, let's say I need a new card and the track on the left has a card back on it. Okay, you know, let me, I can roll the dice over here. But then let's say this one over here has a shop. And then it's like, okay, but maybe I could go over here and buy something that I could help. But I don't know what that shop is actually going to have. And I think that decision making is far more interesting. Because in one way, you're giving up some of the randomness. But in another way, you're making the game feel deeper. Because the player starts to understand that, okay, I can start to learn and make these plans. It's not going to be 100%, obviously, but I can start to you know, put two and two together and maybe I get four on this time. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the difference I, I feel between like a well-designed game that, that uh, you play for a long time compared to a just 
I don't know, dice rolling and then saying like, okay, the <laughs> the person that wrote the more, the higher dice uh, wins, right? That's that's not that that has like a lot of variation, a lot of like outcomes and so on. Uh, can feel emotional, but there's no there's no way to get better at dice rolling. Um, so you have to add those constraints and patterns and rule sets to it, which kind of restrict the randomness, but makes it yeah makes it a game instead of just um, I don't know a toy. Mm-hmm. And I'm <laughs> reading chat right there. If two plus two equals twenty four, then I think you may be in trouble there. You may need you may, your sanity meter may be a little too low, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and like we've said, it's very hard to kind of toe that line or keep that balance because if it's too rigid, then as we said, it becomes a very much a fixed event, and then the player knows, okay, every time I do X, Y will happen. But like you said, the of course, like the great nightmare roguelike design, if it's too random, not only does it become impossible to balance, but then the player just feels like there's no control. And I've played a lot of roguelikes, and unfortunately fall into that case of, okay, I can just close my eyes, and, you know, the game basically just plays itself, because I have no real impact. Because, you know, this time I go left, I die immediately. Next time I go left... I get super treasure and now the run is easy. Yeah, I feel that's kind of like the the biggest trap you can fall into uh, as a game designer of a roguelike game because I feel when you approach a a roguelike and you haven't worked in this genre before, it it might be very um, alluring to Mm -hmm. ramp up the emotions by saying like, oh, wouldn't it be cool like uh, if, if this... Uh, treasure chest that you open, like every hundredth uh, time you would get hit by a a fireball, wouldn't that be like more random, like more content and more engaging and so on, but uh, it it wouldn't, it it would be just more frustrating and more random and if you die from a thing like that without having anticipation um, Mm -hmm. it's it's not good, and especially like if it's if it's that rare, like every hundredth uh, time it's especially very hard to teach also um mm-hmm. it's uh, when i i use like two treasure chests and the the first one i get treasure the second one kills me by the fireball i again i would probably never use the treasure chest again because i it's <laughs> i i get so mm-hmm. few tries to uh, engage with this content that i don't even have enough tries to understand the numbers behind it if it would be like mm-hmm. some content piece like a sword in a video game. And I, I use the sword like thousands of times. You can do something like that. Like every hundredth of time it does like critical damage or something. And eventually I will understand because I use that co- I engage with that content often enough to allow enough experimentation to get into those numbers uh, games. But if it's if it's a roguelike where uh, there's an item and I, I it takes me hours to get to that item or to for it to randomly drop and then I use it and there's a random chance it it explodes in my hand. Yeah, that's just frustrating, and no, no, not a moment where I I learn something as a player. Oh yeah, and like for myself, when I play games like this, if there's anything that has a chance of killing you, I just outright avoid those items. Because mm. for my chat, I know, or we all know that ten percent for most people is more like ninety five percent chance for me that it's going <laughs> to happen in the middle of a run. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's uh, also, I think, why XCOM and other games that show percentage values often fake those percentage values and, like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, uh, give you a behind the scenes more bonus and so on because it's extremely frustrating, even if you see, like, on the screen, like 99%, and you know, <laughs> kind of by math, there's a 1% chance to fail. If you hit that 1%, it's, it's still very frustrating. So they often apply, like, uh, some, some tricks in the background. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you're speaking to somebody who gets all the bad rules. Like, I've <laughs> missed a 95% chance in XCOM ones. And one time I was playing, like, Renown Explorers with, like, a 98% chance to succeed, and I failed. I got the 2% yeah. fail. Like, again, if I had, like, the reverse luck if I ever went to Vegas, you know, I would have owned <laughs> the town by now. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty good, but uh, it <laughs> usually doesn't happen like this. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, time check, we are a little before an hour and 15 in. I think I have probably just a few more questions for you, Riyad. And if the audience has any questions about the Curious Expedition, anything else along those lines, uh, please get them in. I figure maybe another 15, 20 of that works for you. Mm -hmm, sure. Okay. And I guess going back to kind of like combat and interacting, that one of the things that I know is playing the sequel compared to the first game, as you said earlier, is that you're giving the player far more information, which I think is always great. But there's also that argument over how much do you give the player in terms of, okay, if I do X, then either A and B can happen. And because we've seen some games, and this kind of gets back to the discussion we were just having, that if you give them too much information, it feels like you're playing the game for them. I know there are a lot of developers, especially of like Grand Strategy and 4X games, that are very scared of that. That if the onboarding is too good, then it's just basically, okay, the game was telling me, go over here, build a house here, send my army over here, and then kind of like, it's kind of like going the opposite direction, but arriving at that same issue that it becomes a case of being so optimal, optimal why even, you know, play an experiment? Hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's a interesting topic. I think we give the players more information than in the first game uh, and try to, like, help them anticipate outcomes of events. But we are also hesitant to give them too much information because there is a sense of wonder and mystery in the game uh, that we don't want to destroy. So our approach is more like when you do a event, we tell you this event is probably like not super harsh. It has like it won't kill you, um, <laughs> and it has like a seventy percent chance of succeeding. Um, so if you hit the seventy percent, you get a good outcome. If you don't hit them, you get a bad outcome, but not catastrophic. And that's mm -hmm. kind of like the. Le the, the scope of information that we want to relay because um so you don't what we're not telling you is exactly oh if you succeed you find like a a crate with like three whiskey bottles and each whiskey bottle gives you like 20 sanity and so on mm -hmm. um and if you fail you get between seven and nine damage per person and so on there would there could be a a lot more information that we that we could give you if we wanted, but we don't want to. And also, it's it's to be honest, quite challenging because within those um, positive outcomes, if we have to tell you in advance what the, what exact positive outcome it is, it also removes like space for us to have like randomness within that. Um, mm -hmm. For example. There might be like 10 different positive outcomes. Uh, one of them is like you find some interesting loot. One of them is you, f you meet an interesting person and so on. And if we try to tell you that from the start, it, it removes this sense of wonder. Like why would you know in advance that if you hmm. pick up this random item, then a person will come around the corner and help you on some other unrelated thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, that's that's where we fall. And I, I noticed like um there are it's a tricky balance to get right. There are some games that I've played that have given me where I feel like too much information. Um and there are games where I feel they have given me too little information. The ones that give me too little or too few information is are frustrating. The ones that give me too much information can feel like um too mechanical or too much mm -hmm. like I'm I'm I have like the perfect information and I have to make the perfect choice. It reminds me of like when I play chess. Uh I I love chess and but sometimes I can get into my head when playing chess and I I try to <laughs> since it's kind of like the there's no randomness and it's kind of a perfect inf uh, game model. I I sometimes try to anticipate like 10 steps in ahead and I I would just stare at the board for like half an hour and I try to think about any 
any circumstance and every following step that can happen. And sometimes when I uh, play those games that give you too much information, I, I just stare at the button like for five minutes and like tr uh, try to think like should I do like the plus one on fire damage or the plus three on water? Mm -hmm. And again, uh, it comes back to the previous topic of the the winning strategy has to be the the most fun. And if the winning strategy is for me to like take out my calculator and and calculate <laughs> oh like the this the, the thing does like 13 plus percent damage and this one does like 20 and so on it's too much information it makes me get stuck in that inventory decision which i don't feel like super interesting and i would rather have a decision that's taking me a couple of seconds maybe like i think like five seconds about it and then i just make a, a based on partial gut feeling just the choice and move on with like other engaging stuff of the game and i don't want to like linger too long on those things and it's yeah. even in the like in the basic travel mechanic of the game the the space that we are aiming for is that you look at the map and there are around like three four different interesting travel paths and it takes you maybe like a couple of seconds to make a choice or like at most 10 seconds and then you move on yeah. and when we were like in prototype stage this is not uh obvious right like we could have made a game where the rules of traveling are so complicated that you spend literally like two minutes thinking <laughs> about every move and there would be like so much information there and or we could have done the opposite where it's like it's so trivial that you don't spend don't spend any time at all thinking about it and uh, we we try to balance the amount of information you get the the uh kind of the the quality of life features that we have like with like the auto pathing and so on we try to balance those exactly in the right way where we land at this interesting spot of like a couple seconds per decision and making again the this optimal path kind of also like the most fun to play mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's a really good point and yeah, I get into that, you know, deer and headlights situation myself with a lot of like ARPGs where, you know, do I want 800 points of fire damage? Do I want 750 points of burning damage? What about, you know, 300% more ice damage? And, you know, as you said, like it gets to that point of, let me just pull out my calculator and figure out the exact DPS I'm going to do. Oh, this one does 1.78 uh, more DPS. Let me put that one on. And this was, I think, one of the issues I felt kind of robbed the late game when I played Diablo 3. That once I got all the interesting stuff out of the way, it was just a case of chasing that higher number. Oh, good, you know, I spent five hours, I got a piece of, you know, a, a helmet that lets me do 47 more points of damage. Wow, that, that was really worth it. And... One of the things I think that I really enjoyed about stuff like Slay the Spire and Monster Train, more like the deck building, is that the decision is very quick, but it has major ramifications. Okay, I have I can choose one of three cards. Which one do I want? This one lets me have more armor. This one lets me reflect damage. And then, as you say, it becomes that case of, what does my gut tell me? Like, what do I really want to do in this run? And then I start to tailor things around that. And in a way, I, as we said, it removes the randomness, but it brings, I think, the player more into the equation over whether or not they win or lose. And I'll, uh, let me see, and I'll get to uh, uh, Johan's comment and chat in a second. But it reminds you a lot of kind of like earlier roguelike design versus more modern or semi-modern ones. That with the Buying of Isaac, for instance, that game has, I think, over 500, close to 500 different items that can affect your run. And the game doesn't give you any information about what that does until you pick it up. Now, back in the day, that was more than okay. But today, it's basically saying, okay, I hope you have a memory that can hold 500 different items or always keep the wiki next to you. And I feel like that is not as elegant or as well-tuned as kind of roguelike design or modern roguelike elements. Yeah, um, and like I said, even uh, Curious Expedition 1 came out during a time when the genre of roguelikes was not as advanced as today. 
And even for us, I think when you play the sequel, we can you can see the the lessons that we learned also looking at our game and also other games. And for example, uh, for the combat game, that was something we we said a lot during development that for the sequel, we wanted to have a combat game where you don't have to have the wiki open, which we felt was the case in the first game, where to really dig deep into it, you would have to have some reference sheet to look up. And that's why we uh, redesigned it, uh, because we have now a, a better grasp at also what what good game design is in roguelikes and, and what isn't. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and uh, to Johan's comment about Into the Breach, that is such a fascinating example of a game. Like, I respect the hell out of that design, but I ran into that same situation where it gives you so much information that you're. I'm always like in the back of my mind thinking, okay, did I, you know, if I take one more point of damage here, I have, you know, six instead of eight of my energy, I should just restart because I know that three islands down the line, the enemies are going to be doing more damage, I won't be able to compensate. And. It's very risky. It's something that we've been discussing a lot during this conversation about if the player knows too well in advance how a run is going to play out, the run kind of plays itself out. And I'm sure you ran the situation I have myself where I know that, okay, if by X amount of minutes I don't have this specific item or my stats are this high... I should just restart because my chance of winning is now, you know, 10% because I know that boss or this event is going to happen that if I'm not prepared for it, you know, everything else I've done is for naught. Yeah, um, and I feel, I mean, I love Into the Breach, but it's a game that I only play when I'm really well rested. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a game that's very demanding and uh, you have uh, k- kind of like almost perfect information. So it makes me like really ponder and I think a long time about every move. And when I don't, it's it's quite <laughs> punishing uh, and like doing not the op- most optimal move. So it's I, I love that game, but like in the degree of attention, we are trying to ask a little bit less from our uh, players. And like, you don't have to be like, exactly being um like calculating the numbers all the time and making the exact calculation we mm-hmm. again it's we remove enough of that information so it doesn't play a huge factor in your decisions and therefore it makes the game quicker and the the most optimal way and the most fun way aligns uh in mm-hmm. a way that we find more interesting yeah it's of course different also for like if I'm in the in the mood, then Into the Breach is like the perfect game for me. But um, often I'm also like in the mood of I just want to play something now for before going to bed or just like <laughs> while relaxing a bit. Hmm. I'm trying to think. If there's anything else design wise I wanted to ask you. I do want to ask you about kind of the modding community around Curious Expedition next. But anything gameplay or game design wise that we haven't spoken about that you would like to discuss? Uh, let me think. So we talked about that the campaign changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about the challenges of proceduralism. Mm-hmm. I think we covered uh, a lot of areas about the, <laughs> the roguelike design. That's what we often do on these discussions. They can get very in-depth when we start <laughs> rambling about it. Um, yeah, it's cool. I'm enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess here's kind of like more of an aesthetics question for you. With, like, besides the comic book uh, art style from Curious Edition 2, I know there's a lot more uh, fantasy or, you know, like, more outlandish or crazy elements in Curious Edition 2 compared to the first one. I think on the thumbnail that I have for this, there's, I think, your character's riding, like, this multicolor ostrich, and they're about to, like, punch some giant, uh, looking, like, a uh, bird-looking creature. What was, like, I guess, like, the kind of tone that you and the team wanted to approach with the same game, with kind of making it even more over-the-top in that style? Hmm. 
I think um, even the first game was quite over the top, mm-hmm. but we uh, we had the idea of approaching it um, kind of like starting out at a grounding it kind of more closer to the real world, and then as you advance and get really deep into the game, then all of a sudden you start seeing like dinosaurs and like these these really weird elements. But the uh, idea was kind of similar to again like probably something like indiana jones where in the beginning it starts kind of grounded and they have like they're chasing like the 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 grail or um the ark and then only at the like there's always this mystery like is it like really like that magical or not you don't know um it all feels kind of grounded and then towards the end it gets really like the magic comes out <laughs> and uh it goes completely um yeah fantastical and we we try to uh approach it in the same way especially for the first game and then i guess for the second game kind of the secret was out of the box and like everybody knows that we have this content in the game and that it has like very fantastical elements so i think we were we pushed that a bit more forefront also from the communication and so on and like featuring that that stronger in the imagery um and yeah, just generally, I, I think leaning into it, we have now more colors and like more more ways of of expressing that, uh, just even visually. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think that's a good segue into talking a little bit more about the modding side of Curious Expedition One and Two, because I follow you guys on Twitter and I see that there's been a lot of mod support for Curious Expedition One. I have saw there are people who've done, you know, like Doctor Who, they've put like the mm. TARDIS as an event. There's just been a very big support along those lines. And I just wanted to ask, like, from a design standpoint, what are, like, what's, like, kind of, like, your thoughts about, like, allowing or, you know, the craziness that the fans have come up with for a Curious Exposition 1? I'm assuming that they are already come up with mods for number 2. Yeah, that's a good question. I have to, uh, I have to say, um, we support mods for the for the first game. For the second game, we don't do okay. at least yet. Uh, it's also because um, it just since it was a custom engine on the first game, it, it it was quite easy to to set that up. It's it's a bit more challenging for the sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of allowing more expression, it's uh, it can be scary. Um, <laughs> we decided to not have the mods while we were kind of still in the main development phase of the game Mm -hmm. also because we felt to a certain degree we wanted to tell our vision first like our our version of the history and then towards the end when we didn't release that uh much content anymore we were kind of willing and able to pass on the torch and say to the community okay now now you go ahead and you tell your stories uh, you want to see in the game. And kind of sp- timing it like that made it more uh, comfortable for us. Uh, because obviously we we feel very strongly about the game and the content. And um, it can be a bit uh, tricky to let other people kind of mess with that. But also extremely satisfying to see all the cool crazy <laughs> things that people added and we we went uh as far as allowing any combination of mods um so you can it's not like you install one mod and then that's it you can enable multiple of them and there are a couple of them which are a bit like uh copyright rights a bit like questionable so you can have one where like your ducktales characters meet a <laughs> a Star Trek character meeting a Doctor Who and so on. So you can get really crazy uh, (laughs) scenarios uh, set up in the game. That's that's a lot of fun to see. And um, with with the sequel, we don't have modding yet, but like I said, it's a much bigger team now. And even even that for myself is also kind of a a a process of letting go a little bit of my personal vision and kind of letting more people join in and like bring in their influences and their their perspective on the game and so on so even though there's no public modding it's kind of like we have like a it feels uh, on a personal level like an internal modding because 
the game gets so much richer with like more perspective and per perspectives and more influence by by more people bringing in their vision to the game. And that's also very um, exciting to see. Mm -hmm. Any mods from the first game that were like some of like your favorites to see? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think the Doctor Who mod is kind of. Uh, <laughs> It has been in development for a long time, and I think it's it's one of the uh, biggest in scope. So I, I like that one. And there's one um, which uh, you will probably find it if you look it up, like into in the in the top charts of the game, which is a um, thing an artist from Germany uh, redid a lot of the art of the game, and uh, it's super impressive, like the the level of quality they they achieved. Um, so that, that's that's also really one. It's a different. It's not necessarily that it's like just better quality. It's just a a using a slightly different art style, using one that's less inspired by linear clear and like this. What inspired us and like m a little bit more feels like a m more higher res version, like one console generation ahead uh, mm -hmm. than our original graphics. And it's super cool to see that version as well, kind of. Uh, just as a mod. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think with that, to begin to wrap things up for our talk tonight, obviously, as we said, Curious Exposition 2 is officially out of early access. It's been out for, I think, about like a month or so, I think, at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess anything you guys have planned in terms of either continued development for the game, do you have any teasers for another project you're working on? And you can kind of uh, throw breadcrumbs at the people watching or listening right now. Yeah, sure. Um, the first game we developed for, and kept supporting for a really, really long time. Um, like for, for four or five years, we kept actively pushing out dozens of updates and content updates uh, over its lifetime. Uh, we did like a uh, free DLC for it. We did just, I think, like a couple, like a year ago. We did even like a a huge multiplayer mode for it. Um, which is yeah, it's a mm -hmm. small team and the game is four years old, but we st we still it's still uh, close to our heart. And um, I think you can expect that we are treating uh, the sequel in a similar way. <laughs> so right now we are already working on a lot of new content for the sequel or uh, for us kind of the even the 1.0 release is just like the foundational work on which we are building new content and i think the yeah we haven't announced it yet but i think the the next content drop will be quite substantial we'll be adding a lot uh like a new faction to the game and also a new game mode which i'm i'm quite excited to to share and like i said or hinted at before i think people that that didn't like our more uh, narrative story approach this time will will appreciate i think what we have in mind and yeah uh, I, th I think it will be even more interesting it's not like we're just adding like ce1 as a as a game mode or something i think uh we're coming up with something more interesting and um yeah pretty excited about seeing the the reception of that all right great so i think with that um i guess my final question for you for tonight is uh do you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to say to the fans to wrap up the cast with um yeah i Thanks for, for playing the game. Thanks for supporting us. Um, thanks for leaving feedback and sharing our story. Um, this is kind of a dream for us to have this games company and, and to create these games which we uh, which are based on our own like childhood memories and like fantasy and pop culture and everything that we find interesting. And to be able to live off, uh, to create a product like that, and then find enough people that play it, I think it's um, it's amazing and a, a gift. And we are very thankful for that. And um, yeah, that's just what I want to share. That thanks a lot for supporting us. All right. 
And it was great having you on for our discussion tonight, Riyad. If you are free in the future, it's, it'll be always great to catch up and talk more about roguelike design with you. Yeah, absolutely. And one last thing. If there are maybe uh, other game developers or aspiring game developers listening to this, uh, we are not just working on, on a game. or um, We are also working on a tool for game developers, which is a, a project management tool called Codex, Codex.io. And um, if you go to that website, you can sign up with Codex.io slash We Love Podcasts, and you will get a extra uh, welcome gift. Um, and this is the tool we use ourselves to kind of organize all our task management, all our communication internally, and so on. So that's something you can use now as well if you want to. Awesome. All right. So I think with that, we will end things for our discussion tonight. Thank you for everybody watching this either live or recorded. If you want to check out the Curious Expedition 2, there will be links to that in the recorded version. If you are new watching, be sure to join our Discord and check out our Patreon. There are links down below. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I am on there at GWBicer. And uh, as always, uh, do all the liking and subscribing that people keep telling me I need to keep shouting out on these videos. And uh, for you, Riyad, anything social media-wise you'd like to plug, you know, Twitter, Facebook, anything like that. Yeah, you can follow our Twitter account. Uh, it's called Mashi Mensch. Uh, if you search for Machine Mensch, it will probably come up. And uh, I hope to to see you over there. And um, yeah, we'll be having pretty cool uh, news soon for the game. Great. And I'll include links to that in the recorded version as well. So, as always, if you are a developer working on an upcoming game or just want to talk game design, we are always looking for new guests. Or if you're a returning guest, we always like to follow up with you as well. So feel free to reach out. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where he's in the art and science of games. Until next time, everybody, have a great rest of your night and a great Friday. Take care.